You're about to hear a message from our series, The Beginnings, a chapter-by-chapter study of the book of Genesis. In this series, we're discovering how God gives new beginnings over and over again. Grab your Bibles and let's prepare our hearts as we hear a word from God. Have you ever lost something? Maybe your keys, your wallet, and any key losers in church today? Anybody ever lose their keys? With a show of hands, have you ever lost something today? You can't lie, you're in church. We know all the guys should be raising their hands right now. I, I am a loser. No, 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 hey, hey, don't judge. I, I, I lose everything. I, I lose my keys, I lose my wallet, I, I, I lose everything. I, I, I've lost some of my favorite shirts. I don't know how I've lost my clothes. Somehow they just aren't in my closet when I go to find them. I don't know where they went, I don't know what I did with them, but they're gone. I I lose everything and it bothers me because I hate losing things because you waste so much time looking for those things. I mean, I, I, I I lost my microphone and my Bible at church, uh, before church. I, I set it down, I turned around and it wasn't there, right where I remembered that I said it. It wasn't there, and so everyone was running around crazy right before church wondering, where's Pastor Brennan's microphone? Where's his Bible? And I'm like looking at everybody like, I wonder which one of you guys stole it. (laughs) And and everyone's finding it, and then they finally found it, and it was right where I didn't remember that I set it down. I mean, I do it with everything. I did it with my water bottle when I came out to visit in Idaho last time before I moved here. I, I set my water bottle down at one of the kids' playgrounds. I left it there, and then went back to get it. It was gone. Someone stole it. I have a specific sticker on it though. So if I see you walking to church with it, I'll know. (laughs) And then when I moved here, I took my son to our first baseball practice and I bought a new water bottle. They're not cheap. And I brought that to the baseball practice. I set it down. I left and I left it there again. I went back and it was gone. So today I wanna talk to you on the topic of stealing water bottles. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But I just have a propensity to set things down and then forget where I left them. And it bothers me so much because I waste so much time of my life looking for things where they're not there. And it's gotten so bad in my life where just a few days ago, uh, we were gonna take my daughter up on Friday to some hot springs and, and it was her birthday, she turned nine and, and she wanted to go to some hot springs. And so, you know, it's kind of a de- descent down a, a snowy mountain and so, or snowy hill, I should say, up in the mountains, you know. And, uh, and so you wear your snow boots. And so I was looking for my snow boots. I was looking for them everywhere. And they're supposed to be in our hall closets where we keep our, my snow boots. And so I opened the door, they weren't there, so I shut the door and I began looking everywhere else for them. I checked the other closet, I checked our master closet, I checked the garage rack, I checked everywhere, I checked my kids' rooms. I mean, I, I, I was looking everywhere for them. And we're running late now, I couldn't find them anywhere, so finally like, I know what, I'm just gonna grab something else. I opened the hall closet and I looked down to grab something else and they're sitting right there, just right there. And the problem was I didn't have my wife look for them. That's really the problem. Should have had her because she can see those things. But for for me, I looked everywhere else and they were right where they were supposed to be. Have you ever done that before? You look for something everywhere else and then you end up finding what you were looking for right where it was always supposed to be. I, I think that's so appropriate because we do the same. It's a perfect picture of what we often do when it comes to the only thing that can satisfy us in life. The only thing that can satisfy, we look everywhere else where it will never be found. We look for it in substances. We look for it in relationships and sexual experiences or in even true love. We look for what satisfies in marriage or in kids or in grandchildren. We can look for what satisfies us in the next job promotion or look for it in buying a nicer house or building a bigger bank account, or we look for it in more vacations or extracurricular activities, or we look for it even in the hobbies and pleasures that we can enjoy. And oftentimes, once we look for it everywhere else, we realize it's not there. And then we often turn to the one place 
that we can find what we are looking for. We look for it everywhere else and, and then we, we realize I can't find what I'm looking for. I think it's for that very reason that the famous rock band U2 wrote that hit song, I Still Haven't Found What I'm Looking For. It soared to being number one on the Billboard Hot 100 list, the number one single, because the song so strangely resonated in the people's hearts and lives in society. Although I've accomplished everything, although I've gained everything, although I have the wealth and everything that I set out to have, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. I still haven't achieved the thing that will truly satisfy. In other words, I'm still not fulfilled by what I've been looking to fulfill me. But once you find the only thing that can truly satisfy, we then think, it was so dumb. I wasted so much time looking everywhere else and all of the other places for the one thing that could satisfy me in my life. I, I should have checked there first, like Pastor Brennan with the hall closet snow boots. I should have checked there first. I wasted so much time looking everywhere else for it when there's only one place to find what satisfies, what I'm desiring for, what I'm longing for, what I'm looking for, and that's only found in the person of Jesus Christ. That is what will truly satisfy. Amen, church? Jesus Christ. And so many times we can waste time looking everywhere else, and you will finally find what you're looking for when you realize Jesus is everything that you need. And that's what we see in our text today from a man named Abram who later becomes known as Abraham as God will change his name. Abraham, we saw previously, and his nephew Lot have split up. Abram told his nephew Lot that you can choose what land you want and I'll go in the opposite direction. As their businesses, their flocks were growing and expanding, they had to go their separate ways. But Abraham, who had the right to pick the best, he delegated that right. He, he, he said goodbye to his own rights. He, he gave up what would be best for himself. He lived a life of faith, trusting that God will take care of my needs and I'm gonna be a giver. And so Abraham, he gives the choice to his nephew Lot. And, and Lot chose where the grass was greener. He thought, well, the grass is greener on the other side. That's where I'll be blessed more economically. That's where I will be prospered more financially. But we saw last week, it, it might be not more beneficial to you spiritually, even if the grass is greener on the other side economically. Lot chose the place that was better practically, but he did not take into consideration how it would affect him and his family spiritually. And that's where we pick up in Genesis chapter 14, beginning in verse one. About this time, war broke out in the region. King Amraphel of Babylonia, King Arioch of Eleazar, King Ketoleomer of Elam, and King Tidal of Goim, fought against King Bera of Sodom, King Bersha of Gomorrah, King Sinab of Adma, King Shemeber, not Shemtember, of Zeboyom, and the King of Bela, also called Zoar. This second group of kings joined forces in Siddim Valley, that is the Valley of the Dead Sea. For 12 years, they had been subject to King Ketoleomer, but in the 13th year, they rebelled against him. Now, what it's talking about here is there's five kings in this valley, five kings of their own kingdoms that are in this partnership that have been in subject to King Ketoleomer. They've been subject to the king for 12 years, 12 in the Bible and biblical numerology. If you're into Bible study, 12 is the number of government. 13 is the number of rebellion. And on the 13th year, they rebel against their ruling authorities. And these five kings, they rebel against Ketoleomar. And so Ketoleomar forms an alliance with some of his king buddies. And he says, hey, would you guys come with me and help me deal with these guys? 
And so they put together an alliance of four kings and begin to travel towards this valley from Mesopotamia, and they come down to gain control and put these rebellious kings in check. And so verse five, it says, one year later, Ketolaomer and his allies arrived and defeated the Rephaites of Ashtaroth, Karnaim, and the Zuzites of Ham, the Emites at Sheva Kirathim, and the Horites of Mount Seir, as far as El Paran at the edge of the wilderness. And then they turned back and came to En Mishpat, now called Kadesh, and conquered all the territory of the Am- Amalekites and also the Amorites living in Hazazon, Tamar. Then the rebel king of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboim, and Bela, also called Zoar, prepared for battle in the Valley of the Dead Sea. They fought against the king, against King Ketelaomer of Elam, King Tidal of Goim, King Amraphel of Babylonia, and King Arioch of Eleazar. Four kings against five. And as it happened, the valley of the Dead Sea was filled with tar pits. And as the army of the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some fell into the tar pits, while the rest escaped into the mountains. The victorious invaders then plundered Sodom and Gomorrah, and they headed for home, taking with them all the spoils of war and the food supplies. And they also captured Lot, Abram's nephew, watch this, who lived in Sodom and carried off everything he owned. So Ketelaomer and his alliance from Mesopotamia, they invade and they beat badly the five kings that were in rebellion to them. And while king, uh, the king of Sodom's men and the king of Gomorrah's men are beaten badly, they begin to retreat and try to escape. And it says that many of them fall into tar pits. Now catch this. Here's the moral of the story. If you're going to live in sin, you're going to end up in the pits. Sodom and Gomorrah, some of the most licentious, immoral living And what happens is when you live in sin, you'll always find yourself in the pits. You're gonna find yourself in a sticky situation. You're gonna find yourself not where you want to be, the pit of discouragement, the pit of defeat, the pit of depression, because that's where the enemy can do his greatest work when you're stuck in the pits. And so now these men who found themselves in the pits in defeat, While they're in the pits, the enemy is raiding their land, taking with them all the spoils, all the possessions, and the people captive. And among the hostages that they took, we read, was the nephew of Abram, a man named Lot. And it says that Lot, who lived in Sodom, what is Lot doing in Sodom? If you remember, when Abram and Lot went their separate ways, it says that Lot chose the place where it looked better economically, where he could profit more practically. He didn't take into account how it would affect him or his family. And when he went there, it says that he he set up his tents pointing towards Sodom. And then we find him living closer to Sodom. And now in chapter 14, we find him living in Sodom because that's what compromise will always do. The closer we get to the world, the ways of the world, the more that we become like the world or desire the things of the world, we'll find ourselves being destroyed by the enemy. Lot now living in Sodom no longer pursuing God, but pursuing monetary gain, things for himself. It's what always happens when you begin to compromise. The closer you get to living like the world, the farther you will get from where God has for you to be. Here's what I want you to understand today, is that backsliding is not just going backwards. But backsliding can also be the failure to move forward in the right direction. Backsliding can be the failure to move forward in the right direction. And here's what I mean by that. Lot 
It wasn't that he was going back to the old ways. He was moving forward in the wrong direction. He wasn't where God had for him to be, where God desired for him to be. No, Lot was making decisions not based upon the spiritual well-being of himself and his family, but practical things. And we do that too. It's easy to judge Lot. Like, Lot, what are you thinking, you moron? But then we can find ourselves doing that too. Uh, you know what, I, I can't make it to Bible study. If I work a couple extra hours, I can, I can get, uh, you know, ahead for the work week. You know, I'm going to miss church on Sunday. I'm not going to put the Lord first on the first day of the week and the first moment of the day. You know, I, I, I can get some extra stuff done over the weekend. And, and you know, I, I got to get ahead because, well, we got to get these things because we got to buy these things and I'm trying to acquire these things. And I want my account to be here. I want my house to be here. And we have those practical goals, which there's nothing wrong with having those goals. Unless, like Lot, you sacrifice what's best for you spiritually so that you can gain more economically. And that type of mentality will always lead us into captivity and destruction because like Lot, the closer you get to the world, eventually you'll find yourself living in the world. And this is what happens when you live in the world. You find the enemy will come and take you captive and take you away from where you're meant to be and you'll lose everything. Notice this, Lot went where he thought he could gain more. And when he went to gain more, he lost it all. And you compare and contrast that with Abram, the man who gave, the man that said, hey, you can take the pick. You choose where you want to go and I'll go in the opposite direction. He relinquished his right to gain. He trusted the Lord to provide for him, his business, his company. God, you'll provide, but I'm gonna honor you first. And watch how God provides for Abram. It says in verse 13, but one of Lot's men escaped and reported everything to Abram, the Hebrew, who was living near the oak grove belonging to Mamre, the Amorite. And Mamre and his relatives, Eshcol and Aner, were Abram's allies. When Abram heard that his nephew Lot had been captured, he mobilized the 318 trained men who had been born into his household. Then he pursued Kedolaomar's army until he caught up with them at Dan. There he divided his men and attacked during the night. Kedolaomar's army fled, but Abram chased them as far as Hobah, north of Damascus. Abram recovered all the goods that had been taken, and he brought back his nephew Lot with his possessions and all the women and the other captives. So when the word reached to Abram from one of Lot's men. And they came and told Abram, hey, Lot's been taken captive. Abram mobilizes 318 men. And it says that they pursued them night and day all the way until Dan, which was 240 miles from where they currently were. His men ran 240 miles straight with all of their armor, with their weapons, with their supplies, ran 318 men to take on four kings who had just been victorious in battle against five kingdoms. And now 308, this is like, this is like the most epic movie that should be, ever be made. And 318 men, Abraham uses wisdom, attacks at the night, splits his men in half, and they attack and flank from both sides. They think they're under attack, perhaps a huge army, and they flee for their lives. They're, they're dispersed throughout the night, and they chase those men far, far, far away. And Abram, he then gains all the spoils, not only Lot's possessions, but now he gains all of Sodom's possessions, all of Gomorrah's possessions, all the spoils of that massive war. Now it all belongs to Abram. And here's what I want us to see. Don't miss this. Abram humbles himself in chapter 13. He does that to make peace with his family. He gives the better thing to the other person, trusting the Lord that he will take care of him. And says, I'll go in the opposite direction. Lot thought he was choosing the place where he would gain more, but loses everything. And Abram rescues the people 
all of their possessions, and thus now all of that belongs to Abram. All the wealth of Sodom, all the wealth of Gomorrah and the three other cities. And this is the amazing thing how God works. Abram said, you take the best, I'll take whatever's left over. Abram was a giver, Lot was a gainer. And you will find yourself being one of two types of people. You'll find yourself living your life to acquire more, to gain more, to build up your business, to to, to see what I can benefit from others. And you will spend your life figuring out how I can benefit off of other people. Or like Abram, you'll be a man of faith who, or a woman of faith who will trust God in all that he has given to you and say, God, I know that you're in control, that you can provide. I'm going to honor you. God, I'm gonna do what you've asked of me to do. I'm gonna be a peacemaker as you've told me to be. Like in Matthew chapter five, nine, where Jesus said, blessed. That means enlarged. It means that God will either give you something greater or make you into someone greater. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Abram would say, you know what? I'm going to obey God. I'm going to make peace. Yeah, it looks like I'm getting the raw end of this deal. Yeah, it looks like I might be taking advantage. Yeah, I have my rights as the patriarch of the family to choose first, but that might cause a division within my family. And so instead, I'm going to make peace and I'm going to trust God to provide. And look how the story ends up. Two contrasting lives. One who's trying to gain it all, loses it all. One who's willing to give it all up, gains it all. And isn't that what Jesus taught there in Matthew chapter 16, verse 26, when Jesus said, and what do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but lose your own soul? Is anything more valuable to you? Is anything worth more to you than your soul? Jesus said, if if you want to gain the world, you first must lose it. If you want to find what life is all about, you must first give up your life. It's the way of the Christian life. And sometimes that doesn't make sense. What do you mean I have to give up my life? I have to give up my rights? I I have to give up what rightfully belongs to me? I just give it to God? I just surrender it to God and say, God, you're in control of it? That's so difficult to do when it comes to something that is for us personally. And that's why Abram is known as the father of faith because he models what it means to walk by faith, not by sight. Because we might not see how it's gonna work out, but Abram simply trusts God. He trusts that God knows what's best. He trusts that God knows what he's doing, even though Abram doesn't. And Abram simply does what God asks of him to do. And when God sees a life like that, a person like that, that's not living life trying to grasp on and hold on to everything that I can gain, but living life with open hands, relinquishing, saying, God, this is yours. When God sees a person that lives a life like that, God is able to bless them so much more. And here's the reason why it puts us in a posture to be able to receive from God. I've shared this with you before, but when we live with closed, clenched fists, holding on to all that we're trying to gain, we're not able to receive when God pours out his blessings. And when God pours out his blessings, Oftentimes we miss out on the greater thing that God wants to do in our lives because our fists are closed. Like, this is mine. I got to keep this. I want this. This is it. And God has something so much greater, but because we're, our fists are closed, we can't receive. But when we live life with open hands and we say, God, all that I have belongs to you. Abraham recognized that. Abraham recognized that all that he was able to receive was from God. He lived life with open hands. And thus, he was able to continue to receive what God had for him. He wasn't living life to be gaining. He was living life to be giving. And the ones that live life to give are able to gain more because God knows he'll be able to bless you 
because you'll be a blessing to others. And when God sees a person not trying to hold on, but to relinquish, God is able to bless them with so much more. Now, I'm not talking prosperity doctrine here. I'm not saying, you know, in church today, if you put $5 in that dog box, here's what God's going to do. He's going to give you $500. $500 for anyone who put $5 in that box today. Hey, I pray the Lord. Amen. I do that pretty good, don't I? I'm not saying that, but what I will say is this. How God always works is when you relinquish what he's asked of you to relinquish to him, God, whatever he gives to you, it might not be in the same form that you've given to him, but whatever he gives to you will be far better than what he's ever asked of you. And you will never regret, regret relinquishing something to God that he's asked of you because God will always replace it with something better in your life. So now watch what Abraham does with all of these possessions in verse 17. After Abram returned from his victory over Ketoleomar and all of his allies, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Shava, that is the king's valley, and Melchizedek, the king of Salem, and a priest of God, most high. He brought Abram some bread and wine. Melchizedek blessed Abram with this blessing. Blessed be Abram by God, most high, creator of heaven and earth. Watch this. And blessed be God most high, who has defeated your enemies for you. Then Abram gave Melchizedek a tenth of all the goods he had recovered. It's interesting, Abraham is now met by two completely contrary kings. These are the contrary kings. On Abraham's way back home, after beating those four kings badly, He's met by two kings. One, the king that's called Melchizedek. Now, you might be wondering, who is this mysterious man, Melchizedek, this king that wasn't named before that shows up? Who is this mysterious man? Well, it's impossible to be dogmatic about this. But if you put all the evidence together, it seems that this clearly is describing Melchizedek as what is called a Christophany. Now, a Christophany is the appearance, the physical appearance of the Son of God on earth before he came as the babe born in Bethlehem, Jesus of Nazareth. You have to realize that Jesus didn't come into existence when he was born into the world, that Jesus is a part of the Trinity that has always existed. And the Son of God throughout the Old Testament will appear before people. And most likely, that's what Melchizedek who he is. And the reason why is Melchizedek's name means king of righteousness. That's going to be the name given to Jesus in the kingdom age. Jeremiah 26 verse 3, talking about Jesus, says, and his name shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Yahweh said canoe is that Greek phrase. He is our righteousness. That's the title given to Melchizedek. He's not only the king of righteousness, but it says he's the king of Salem. Salem means peace. And there's only one king of peace. That is the prince of peace, Jesus Christ. And he's not only the king of righteousness and peace, but it says he's the priest of the most high. A title given to Jesus, the one who is always making intercession for us. You see, the priest would go into the temple and burn incense in prayer making intercession on behalf of the nation and God. But now Jesus is the great high priest who took our place, who the Bible says is always making intercession on behalf of us. Jesus in his priestly role. And now why does I think that means that Melchizedek is Jesus? Here's the reason why. Because God forbid any king to be both king and priest other than Jesus Christ. You could be king and prophet. David was that. He was both king and a prophet. You you could be priest and prophet. Aaron was that. He was a prophet of God and a priest. But you could not be both king and priest. Uzziah, a great king, tried in 2 Chronicles chapter 26. He was a good ruler. He expanded the borders. He was blessed by God, but he said, I will go into the temple and burn incense. I will go do the priestly responsibilities. And God struck him with leprosy because of his disobedience. But Melchizedek is priest of the Most High and the King of Salem. 
something that was limited to only Jesus Christ to being. And then you see Abram, he bows down and worships him. After defeating four of the most powerful kings in all the land and the territory, this one king comes up. Abram could say, you know what? I'm the most powerful guy around. But he falls on his face and he worships him, bows down before him. And what's in the hands of Melchizedek? Bread and wine, the elements of communion. What did Jesus say? To do this in remembrance of me. Remembering what? Remembering the deliverance that I've given to you how I've defeated the enemy for you, how I have done it for you. Remember what I have done for you. Melchizedek shows up with the elements of deliverance and Abraham realizes from the blessing that Melchizedek gives to him that says, God has defeated your enemies for you. And in response to that, Abram gives Melchizedek a tithe recognizing that all Abram has acquired, all the possessions that he now has, wasn't because his 318 men who were well-trained were able to defeat the four kings. No, he realized that the victory belonged to God and God gave him victory. God gave him 100% of everything that he had. And so now Abram responds by giving God a tithe. Some translations put it a tenth. That's what a, the word tithe means. It means a tenth or 10%. That the first 10% of all that we have, all that comes our way, it belongs to God. And, and, and some people don't understand what a tithe means. And that's why it's important to understand because some of us in church, we, we five. And five or we, we, we tooth. You know, we, we, don't, we don't tithe. We don't really give God because we think, well, that's a, that's a lot to give to God. And we look at 10% of the first fruits of all that God's given us and we think that, that's too much. That's too much to give to God until you realize this one simple truth that Abram realized this day. All that was given to him was given to him from God. And now Abram responds by giving back to God just 10% of all that God had given to him. The times that we will struggle most in the area of our tithe, the area of our giving to God and relinquishing to God what is rightfully his, the time that we will struggle with that the most is when we don't recognize that every good thing that we have is from God. That God's given us 100% of all that we have. And you might say, well, wait a minute, pastor. You know, I've worked my tail off. I've worked so hard to build the company. I've worked so hard on my job. I've earned that. Yeah, who do you think gave you that job? Who do you think has blessed you with the ability, the skill set to be able to do that job? Who do you think gave you the vision to start that company or to work that in such a way? Who do you think opened the doors for you to step through? God has blessed you with it all. I mean, even Abram's men who were well-trained, that had their skill set, these guys were warriors. Even they recognized it wasn't because of their own skill but God is ultimately the one who gave them victory that day. And so Abram relinquished it to God, recognizing that it was all given to him by God. Most of us have a hard time relinquishing to God what is rightfully his because we don't realize it's all from him. And the reason why I say most people, not all people, but most people, because statistics show on tithing within church It indicates that 25% of any congregation, only 25% or less of any congregation actually tithes. And on average, nationally, only around 2.5% of their income is given to God. All the resources that we have ultimately are from God. And God has called us to be managers, or the Bible calls us stewards. We're not owners. And God has entrusted us 100% to start, God says, I want you to relinquish 10% back to me and I'm gonna let you manage 90% of what still belongs to me because you don't own anything. But I'm gonna let you manage it for my purposes. Perhaps a better way to say it is this way, 100% of it is God's, but God lets you manage 90% of it. And when you don't give to God the tithe, the 10th, the first 10th, 
it's not that we're not giving to God. Note this, because we think, you know, I, I, need to, I, I should give to God or I need to give to God. No, it's not that you're not giving to God. It's actually that you're stealing from God because it's his. And you're not giving to him what belongs rightfully to him. Malachi chapter three says that we're actually robbing God. And so that's why it's so important that we recognize because it will give us a greater passion because 10% is just the minimum of what God asks for us. Morgan, my wife and I, we've been challenging ourselves to what, do we wanna spend the rest of our lives just giving God the minimum of what he's asked of us? What more can we do of what God has entrusted to us? What, what more can we get? Do I wanna spend the rest of my life saying, God, You've given this all to me. You've blessed me in this way, but I'm gonna continue the rest of my life, give you the very minimum and the very least of what you require. Abraham recognized that the battle belonged to the Lord. All that he had was given to him by God. It was really all his, so it was not hard for him to give to God. Now it gets better and we'll end here. Verse 21, the king of Sodom, and Se Sodom said to Abram, give back to my people who were captured but you may keep for yourself all the good. That's all the stuff of Sodom, all the stuff of the world you have recovered. You can keep it all. And Abram replied to the king of Sodom, I solemnly swear to the Lord God most high, creator of heaven and earth, that I will not take so much as a single thread or sandal thong from what belongs to you. Otherwise you might say, I am the one who made Abram rich. I will accept only what my young warriors have already eaten, and I request that you give a fair share of the goods to my allies, Anar, Eshkol, and Mamre. Abram says, listen, I don't want the stuff of the world. I don't want all the stuff that you're offering to me. Listen, the king of Sodom, all the stuff of the world, he said, hey, you can have it all all the stuff of the world, I'll give it to you all. And the king of Sodom, Sodom is an illustration of Satan, a perverted person who will always offer the world to you so that he can have the people's souls. Abram said, I don't want any of your stuff, why? Why was Abram so easily, after he gained so much, be able to say, I don't want it? because he already recognized that it was given to him by God. It didn't belong to him in the first place. And he met with God. He already said yes to God when it came to the power of the possessions. And Abram's possessions didn't possess him. And so he was able to say no to the world because he had already said yes to God. Listen, this gives us a tremendous truth that I want us to close with and remember today. How did Abraham have the ability to say no to the enticing things of the world? No, how do, how do we have the ability to say no to the things of the world and yes to God? It's when you say yes to God first, then you're able to say no to Satan. Abram had communion with God the bread and wine, he communed with him and he gave his tithes to them. When you spend time with God and you give to God and you're with God, when Satan shows up and says, hey, I wanna get in on this too, you can say, beat it, buddy. I don't need your stuff. You can hang that on your horn. I, I don't need it. I don't need anything from you. Why? Because I am so full, I just communed with the king of kings. And the Bible says where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Abram put his treasure in the kingdom of God, and so his heart followed. Abram, he went his way victorious that day because he said yes to God, spent time with God, worshiped God, gave to God. And because of that, he was able to say no to all the enticing things that the world could throw his way. Now, naturally, we're not addicted to giving. Naturally, none of us are like, hey, man, I just can't wait to get something so I can give it away. No, most of us were addicted to, to getting. And that's why marketing companies full on advertise so much. You know, there's a sale for everything. There's a Black Friday sale, a before Christmas sale, an after Christmas sale, a New Year's sale, spring sale, summer sale. There's always some sale. Why? Because like, hey, good deal. I gotta get it. I gotta get it. I gotta get it. 
I gotta get, 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 get. Sound like a rap song. I gotta get it. And, and, and that's how oftentimes naturally we live. But when's the last time you said, you know what, I gotta give it. I gotta give. I, I, I'm looking for somebody that I can bless. I, I wanna find somebody that I can get. We naturally, our natural propensity isn't to do that. No, we're, we're addicted to, to getting. We buy things that we don't need with money that we don't have to impress people we don't like. <laughs> but Abram, he found a better way. Listen, to gain, it's the way of Lot. If any man wants to gain the world, he must first lose himself. If any man wants to first gain life, he must lose his life. It's the great paradigm of the Bible and the great paradigm of Christian life. I give to God, and then the life that God calls me to live will be so much greater. Hey, when you relinquish to God, it puts you in a position to receive from God, and you'll finally find what you're looking for when you realize the way of lot, the way of gaining isn't going to be what's going to satisfy and I can look for all of the things that would satisfy in all of the wrong places. I can look for it everywhere else. But there should come a point in our lives where we realize it was always where it was meant to be. It was so stupid that I spent so much time looking for those snow boots two weeks ago, or two days ago. So much time was wasted. So much of our lives can be wasted trying to gain to satisfy our souls when the only thing that can satisfy our souls is Jesus Christ. It's right where we'll always be found when you turn to Jesus. Make today the day you turn to Jesus. Thank you for joining us today. We pray you were blessed by the biblical truths revealed in today's message. We are always encouraged to hear how God is using this ministry to touch lives. If God has been transforming your life through this ministry, or if you would like to help support this ministry financially, you can go to our website, cceagle.com. Being in a community with believers is essential to the life of a Christian, and we would love to be in fellowship with you no matter where you're joining us from in the world or in what season of life you're in. We hope you'll join us again at Calvary Chapel Eagle.